everyone. We're so happy to have you here with us on the Stronger Marriage webinar produced by the Utah Marriage Commission, hosted by Utah State University. I'm Alexis Alcott, the UMC Interim Program Coordinator, and we are excited to have you here join us as we celebrate 25 years of marriage celebrations in 2023. A big part of us celebrating these marriage celebrations is this webinar series that we're doing. And in today's webinar, we're so excited to be joined by Dan Purcell. Dan and his wife, Emily Purcell, are the founders of Get Your Marriage On. Their, web their marriage went through a bit of a renaissance a few years ago and wanted to share what they learned with other couples. They created a fun and sexy bedroom game app called Intimately Us that has been downloaded over 300,000 times. They put on events and retreats for couples. Dan is the host of the Get Your Marriage On podcast. Dan also coaches others on marriage and intimacy. Dan and Emily have been married for over 19 years and have six kids. Dan loves cracking dad jokes, running marathons, planning the next creative date night with his sweetheart, and enjoys the magnificent outdoors around his home in St. George, Utah. This webinar will show that no matter where you are with regards to intimacy with your partner, there's always a next level. In this webinar, Dan Purcell outlines his five-step framework about what internal work every person can do to draw closer sexually, emotionally, and spiritually with their spouse. If you have any questions, please ask them by entering your questions to the Q&A function, which will be found at the bottom of your screens. The chat will be turned off during his whole presentation, so this is really the best place to ask him any questions. We'll have that 15-minute Q&A at the end of your presentation, so write down your questions and save them for the end. If you've joined us for the CEU credit, make sure to stay on until the end of the presentation. The survey needed for your credit will automatically loan out to the screen, and then you'll receive an email from the Utah Marriage Commission with your certificate. We also, you can also email the Utah Marriage Commission email if that doesn't load for some reason, which is marriagecommission at usu.edu to receive your survey on this webinar. Once the survey is completed, you'll obtain an email with your CEU credit certification. We'll now turn the time over to Dan for his presentation. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here tonight with you. What a great turnout we have. And I'm so excited to share with you these things that are important to me. Um, my promise is I'm going to be 100% totally honest with you tonight. I'm going to tell you how it is. And the thing is, intimate marriages take a lot of work, but it's worth it because intimate marriages have a lot of freedom, passion, desire, and excitement. When I say an intimate marriage, I'm saying an intimate marriage. Let me define that real quick. There's functional marriages, and then there's intimate marriages. A functional marriage is where the two can carry on the tasks of running a household or you know, the business side of marriage really well, raising children, paying bills, like, like those things, they can do that really well. An intimate marriage, though, is, is more, it's where the two are lovers, they, there's closeness, there's something alive between them that's growing. That kind of a marriage has a lot of freedom, passion, desire, alivement, and excitement, but it also is not an overnight success, but I believe it's possible for everyone. In the next 50 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about why most marriages stay the same what gets in the way of building a great marriage and why couples have a lot of conflict about sex and what you can do about it. Uh, thank you for being here. And you're in the right place if you or you, any of your clients desire a richer, more exciting sex life. You wish your spouse was on the same page with you sexually. You or some of your clients feel like they're living beneath their privileges as a couple. Like they can experience so much more, but we only have a little taste of what it can be or your clients crave intimacy and closeness. It's that emotional side or that physical side, just being really close to someone that matters to them. You're also in the right place if you or your clients just desire to understand your sexuality better, or if you struggle with sexual desire, or if your spouse does, or if you grew up thinking that sex was dirty or not virtuous, or another common theme I see in the couples I coach is this idea that sex is for the man, not for me. Um, those things can get couples tripped up. Or you might be uh, experiencing a life transition. 
such as a new job, a baby, or uh, children leaving the nest are examples. Those are exposing relationship problems. Um, the truth is that a lot of couples think this. The truth is that life is hard. There's a lot of forces that push against a marriage. And sex in a marriage can get backburnered so easily. And a lot of us have pressure from work, bills, the busyness of life. And then there's also like popular culture, people with very legalistic thinking in their background or family culture or messages that is basically anti-sex in marriage, uh, anti-pleasure, anti-connection in marriage. Um, or sex you just, just gets relegated to the back burner too easily for just too many people. Uh, the real problem isn't our parents or our upbringing or religious culture. We'd like to think so. That's why sex isn't coming easy, right? We want to think that. But, and then we also want to think, oh, I don't have a great sex life because it's a lack of time or work. Or uh, I've got these other responsibilities. I volunteer with the church or my community, whatever it is, or it's my kids or it's my social media. If my spouse would just get off her phone, we'd have more connection, <laughs> whatever it might be. That's what we think is the problem. But I don't think that's the real problem here. Those are exposing a deeper problem. The real problem is a lack of awareness and how to respond to the challenges. It's a lack of knowledge. And it's just not having the tools or skills. And they might have all those things. And if that's, if that's not it, it's a lack of courage to deal with the challenges that we have. I just want to ask you, how would it feel if you just felt more closeness and intimacy in your relationship? How would your clients feel if they experienced that too? How would it feel if you just felt like you had a really honest and real relationship? You can be really honest and, you know, none of this hiding. You can, you can lay things out the way they are. What if you had an adventurous, playful, and easier sexual relationship? And you found that sex for you is a source of fun and replenishment. It's a way to get rejuvenated. It's like taking a vacation. <laughs> and then how would it feel if you lived to your full potential? as a couple. Well, these are the things we're going to talk about today. But quickly, uh, let me introduce myself real quick. Um, as I said in the intro, I've been married over 19 years. I have six children. I live in St. George, Utah. I love it here. I started Get Your Marriage On in 2017. And I'll tell you the story how that started in just a moment. But um, my background is in software development at first. I created some apps called Intimately Us and Just Between Us. They've been downloaded 550,000 times. And that's what really got me interested in helping couples in their relationships. I have a podcast with over, uh, I need to update the slide, 700,000 listens. I've done conferences, retreats, and workshops attended by thousands of people. And I think the most important thing you need to know about me is that I am on a mission to help couples have a better sex and intimacy in their lives. And um, once I experienced some of these things for myself, I went back to school to learn how to be a professional marriage uh, counselor and coach. And so that's what I spend a lot of my time doing now is I work one-on-one -on -one or in group settings with individuals and couples to help them improve their sexual intimacy in their marriages. Now, my wife and I, my wife is Emily. And she's darling, isn't she? <laughs> uh, we both come from really good families. Um, you know, parents love each other and those kinds of things. But uh, in our upbringing, sex wasn't talked about much. Maybe you can relate. At least the pleasure side of sex wasn't talked about. We had great talks on, you know, biological reproduction. We had the talk on what not to do, you know, uh, the avoiding um, sexual intercourse until marriage, and those kinds of discussions. We've had plenty of those and the dangers of pornography and other things. We had those in our household growing up. But as far as like how to have fun in sex, the pleasures and joy that come from a great sexual union, those conversations just were completely absent. And unknowingly, we inherited a lot of this anxiety about sex coming into our marriage. In fact, we're so anxious we didn't even like feel comfortable Googling our sex questions or uh, it was such a taboo topic, right? Um, 
I remember right after I was married, I had all of these sex questions because I, I didn't understand why things were the way they were, why my body behaved the way it did and my wife. And I just had these questions. And I was a student at the time and I went to the university library and I looked up a book and I found a textbook somewhere on human sexuality. I was so nervous. I didn't want to be caught looking at that book in the library. And I waited until a quiet time. I went to the third floor. I made sure no one was looking. <laughs> And I pulled that book off the shelf and I ran to get it checked out. And I didn't make eye contact at all with the, with the woman, you know, scanning the book and my ID card to check out the book. I was so anxious about sex. I go home, I flip open, you know, leafing through the book. And there's a few illustrations of, of couples engaging in various sex positions. And I freaked out. So I shut the book and I returned it the next day, never to look at it again. There's just a lot of anxiety I inherited. Um, and as you can imagine, probably my wife and I, when it, we could have sex, but talking about sex between us was always an anxious conversation that we were very glad to both avoid until one day. I was uh, at this point, I've been married 13 years and I had a conversation with a friend and this friend opened up to me about his sex life. And it wasn't like he's there to brag about what his wife and I do. He was, he was trying to tell me that when he and his wife started working on improving their sexual relationship, all of these other benefits started coming from it. They were communicating better. The bond between them was closer. They loved each other more. They could parent together better. All these benefits they experienced from having a stronger sex life. But he was like telling me some really specific things he and his wife were doing in bed and things they were buying and things they were trying. And I guess you could say I had morbid curiosity. <laughs> like, ew, no, no, wait, tell me more. <laughs> like, oh, that's gross, wait, tell me more. <laughs> I was so curious. Um, Because in my mind, I didn't know there was, you could like, you, it was that it was okay to actually really like sex and to enjoy it. And there's all these benefits that are fun from it. And you don't have to do it in ways that, to like violate my values. So that was kind of like a new concept for me. I was really unsure about it. I go home that night to my wonderful wife and say, hey, you never guess what kind of conversation I had today. And I told her about this conversation with this friend. And that was a start for us on our journey to strengthen our sexual relationship. Because we decided there's a lot we don't know. We need to know more about this. We want to know more about it. Uh, in the next 12 months, we started with books. We Together, we read 12 sex books together, marriage books. We found podcasts. We found blogs. We found all these resources that really helped us strengthen our marriage. And in a short amount of time, we started experience. My friend was telling me about it. My wife and I, our marriage improved. Our bond between us became stronger than ever. And the sacred, I, I, to me, I, they're sacred. The, these vows, these covenants that we've made when we were married, they took on new meaning for us, a deeper meaning. And then all of a sudden, like we're communicating better. We're, co we're parenting together better. The sky is bluer and the grass is greener. Just all these things in life went better once our sex life really improved. And then I, I couldn't get enough. You know, after you know, we have a stronger bond, we have these new meanings. There's more fun and freedom and play between us. We're more relaxed in our relationship. And then our marriage just took on this new level of we can be really real. There's less pretense. Because if we can talk about something as vulnerable as sex and actually work together to improve our sexual relationship, what else can't we tackle, right? <laughs> we, got, we got this shot in the arm. Um, and that was about six years ago. And I got to tell you, uh, oh, and as a result of all this, we created the Intimately Us app, which has been really popular because... That's what I knew how to do. And that's our way of sharing my knowledge and experience with the world at that time. And that's when the real challenges in my own relationship began. <laughs> what I've learned is once you achieve a level like we did six years ago, it's not just bliss. It's not a happily ever after. There's always going to be a next level after that. And there's always going to be a next level. So since that wonderful time, we've also dealt with I got to be honest with you, desire differences. We have different preferences in our sexual behaviors and tastes, uh, uh, such as frequency. We've had to really address resentments. Um, 
And we've also experienced a lot of like financial hardship. There's children interrupting our plans. There's stresses from life. Like we've experienced it all. And I guess my main conclusion here is that there's always a next level, no matter where you are in your relationship. Um, you can always improve your sexual relationship because there's always going to be something more. There's always going to be a next level. But so what does it take to then to build an intimate and exciting and sexy marriage to take you wherever you are to your next level? I want to share with you what I've learned interacting with thousands of couples. I get a privilege of, with my work, with my line of work. I get to hear stories from couples telling me about their sex lives, telling me about their sexual experiences, telling me about their hangups, telling me about the difficulties in their relationship that contribute to things. And I've also, in all of this, uh, talked to many couples who have a fantastic thriving and growing sexual relationship in their 50s and 60s and beyond. So what does it really take? What's their secret? Well, I've boiled it down to what I call A, B, C, D, E, and I'm going to share this with you right now for the rest of our time together. A is for awareness. So if you can picture this, it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm sitting by my front door and I'm tying on my running shoes. I love to go running, except it's 10 o'clock at night this time. And what you don't know is I'm really frustrated. I'm really frustrated with my wife. I'm frustrated where, at this time where things are in our marriage relationship. And I think it's all her fault. So I go on a, on a nighttime run to kind of blow off some steam. My feet are hitting the pavement rhythmically. There's stars shining up above. And about a quarter mile in, I start to think, well, maybe I have a part to play in the reason why things are the way they are. And about a half mile in, I'm like, well, actually, yeah, yeah, I... Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't all entirely her fault. I, I, I do some things too that, that, that contribute to our current problem. Anyway, a mile in, I'm like, yeah, I, I totally set her up for failure. It was, it was me, my doing. And by the time I finished my run, I realized, oh, I have a huge role to play in our current dynamic. And there are things that I, if I'm going to be really honest with myself, I can really take on myself and really fix and repair my side of the street here. It's not entirely my fault. I'm sorry, it's not entirely my wife's uh, fault. And it's unkind of me to point the blame at her. Do you see how uh, I, this run kind of uh, helped me be more aware of my role and contribution in the things? The thing is, our brains coast on autopilot most of the time. It's like our default state. We don't think about our thoughts. We don't do metacognition very well. And the reason why is our brains, there's, they like three things. Our brains like low effort because they want to be efficient, right? They want to conserve energy and thinking hard about something takes up a lot of mental power. The second thing our brains hate is they like, they hate pain. Anything that's discomfort or uh, anything like that, they hate. That's why taking on yourself and like thinking, how am I contributing to my marriage problems? It requires you to really deal with some uncomfortable feelings that you'd rather avoid. And the third thing why it's why we're on autopilot most of the time is our brains seek pleasure. We like to, to be drawn to things that are easy for us, simple for us, things that we don't have to like put a lot of effort into because they feel good. So again, low effort, efficiency, avoid pain, prioritize pleasure. That's what our brains do. And that's why we go on autopilot so many times. We also have the lower brain and the upper brain, um, I, of course, like the limbic, more thinking with more limbically or with your prefrontal cortex. And when you're emotionally stimulated, it's hard to think with your prefrontal cortex. And that's also the part of your brain that helps you form relationships with other people too. So it's no wonder why when we cruise on autopilot, it interrupts our ability to really connect with someone. So when you coach or uh, give therapy or counsel people, my first step is really help them understand awareness. So the problem is we all have blind spots. We miss cues. We underestimate. We generalize. We blame others because that's what our autopilot brain does. So what awareness does then in practice is it helps you and your clients become more aware of their thoughts. 
you help people pick out what are the stories they're telling themselves over and over and over. And you probably in your training uh, have an awareness model of some some type, maybe it's CBT or um, um, you know IFS, whatever it is that you help them kind of become more aware in their body, in their mind. What is it about it? Uh, journaling, uh, going on a run, like for me, or talking it out, like anything I could do to help them become more aware of their thoughts and the way they're thinking about things takes their thinking off of autopilot and from that lower brain to the higher brain. And the, the end sum of all this that I think is so important is you help them recognize what they have control over and what they don't have control over. Because so many times people are anxious, they worry because they're too focused on things they don't have control over rather than focusing on their tasks on things they do have control over. A really good example of this is my friends, Jan Marie and Andrew. They struggled in the marriage for 22 years and I met them. They came to one of my retreats and at that retreat, they gain enough skill and awareness that they could actually have a discussion about something that's been bothering them for a long time. Now, the thing that I admire about them is in the past, they'd have these conflicts and they'd address them, but they would never resolve it because it would get to get too much for them. They'd never like see it to the end. Well, at this retreat, they stayed in that struggle enough to really come to a resolution. And if you want to hear more about their story, I interviewed them on my podcast. It's episode 108. And it's a fantastic story of how awareness helped a couple really break through their problems. All right, so that's my letter A. Ready for letter B? I call it balanced belonging. And this is balance between what I want and my spouse or belonging to myself or belonging to myself. Let me give an example. Um, so my wife, Emily, feels pressure to have sex with me to keep me happy. And this is kind of her upbringing. This is the way she was taught. Like, you should always have sex with your husband, even if you don't feel like it, because he needs it. Uh, that was kind of the messaging she received inadvertently, covertly growing up. This is kind of what she picked up. Um, now, I kind of like that she has that uh, thinking because it serves me. I like that she feels pressure to have sex with me when I want it because I get it. I get the sex I want when I want it. However, it's not exactly what I want because what I really want is I want her to want it, not from a sense of duty. But here's, here's the pernicious thing. If I rock the boat and tell her, I know you want to have sex with me because you think it's important for me and it's good for because you know that your husband wants it, but I know you really don't want it. If I rock the boat and say, hey, uh, you really don't have to have sex with me for that reason, then I'm worried that she'll go, oh, phew, then I'll never want to have sex with you ever because I never want to have sex. And then I don't get sex. So because I'm afraid to rock the boat, I'm going to continue the pattern and the dynamic of putting sex in the frame of it's a need, it's something I want, you need to do it to keep your husband happy, it's important for your marriage, even if you don't feel like it. Because in a sick and twisted way, I'm kind of getting what I want, but I'm really not getting what I want. And for my wife on her end, she's not getting what she wants too, because she doesn't feel like she belongs to herself. She doesn't feel like she has a whole say in the matter. And so what we do is we keep this pattern going because neither of us are courageous enough to rock the boat. This is just an example of something we've worked with on the past. And I think the heart of the matter has to do with balanced belonging. Let me explain this a little bit more. When I say belonging, and there's two parts of this, we Every human being wants these two things, which sometimes seem um, at a, you know, opposed to each other. We want to belong to ourselves. That is autonomy, freedom. I can develop myself. I can know myself. I can do things I want to do. That's like belonging to yourself. We also want to belong to others. That's like, I want to know that I matter to others. I want to know that I'm part of a family or a tribe, that I have influence on other people. Like, that's a really important thing too, belonging to myself and belonging to others. I really want, we want both of those things, but at times they feel like they're at odds. Kind of like an example I just shared with you with, with our marriage dynamic. Now, 
what some couples do is when it's out of balance, it happens in uh, one of two ways. The first one is I call entanglement. Entanglement is when you have too much belonging to each other and not enough belonging to yourself. And it's like this yarn that's tangled in this picture here. It's, it's messy. And this is, I see it so often. I saw it today in my coaching sessions. They need their spouse to be okay in order for me to feel okay. So uh, they don't think of it in those terms, but when their spouse is upset or when he wants sex, for example, I better give him sex so he calms down. So whew, I get to calm down. So you manage your anxiety by managing other people's emotional state. And once they're calmed down or fixed or whatever it is, finally, I get a rest. It creates this codependent relationship because you need and depend on other people to be in an emotional state for you to manage your and regulate your own emotional state. Uh, and this leads to a lot of over-functioning or under-functioning in relationships. Now, the opposite is also pernicious. And I call that toxic individualism. <laughs> and that's the, I can do whatever I want and he or she has to be okay with it. That's the opposite end of the spectrum. And this is not conducive if you want to be in relationship with someone else, right? What we really want is a healthy interdependence. And I love this image of these pillars because in order for these pillars, this archway on this photo to work, each pillar has to be strong and be like uh, stand alone. And then the archway connects them. That's like the model that we want, this healthy interdependence. And it can only happen when each person is bringing their best self and is in integrity to themselves in the relationship. It requires you to be really like have this relational thinking. And more importantly, it requires you to be able to manage your own emotional state independent of your spouse's emotional state too. And that happens because um, you see your spouse as a separate person. They have their own feelings too. And uh, you just focus on your tasks of, of your relationship and your side without being too overly obsessed about, um, about what they want. And I can talk to you more about this in the Q&A too, if you want, but I'm going to move on for time's sake. Uh, the important point in all this is we always co-create our marriage dynamic. Are we doing things out of duty or is it wholeheartedly loving? Are we participating in these dynamics unwittingly? Um, uh, sorry, a lot of couples participate in whatever their dynamic is unwittingly, not really seeing it for what it is. And so once they understand this concept of balanced belonging, you know, belonging to myself versus balance, having that good balance, then when, you know, if they're out of balance, bring it back in balance, it really helps them see how they're contributing to their marriage and making things better. Uh, Mark and Mindy were guests on my episode, on my podcast. It's episode 63. Uh, there were a couple that were on the brink of divorce. They definitely had this like entanglement and toxic individualism problem. The pendulum would swing from one side to the other. And as a result, their marriage was very superficial. And they're like, well, there's not much depth here. So I think we're going to divorce. And then they learned how to balance their belonging better. And they learned how to overcome their challenges and work through them. And it's a success story. You can listen to episode 63 to see uh, for more details about that one. Okay, we talked about A, awareness, B, balanced belonging. Now we're going to talk about courageous action. Amy and Greg have been married about 20 years at this point in their marriage, and they're living parallel lives. They're like roommates. Uh, they have four kids. They're raising four kids. He had a busy job. He traveled a lot for his work. Uh, she taught piano lessons and didn't really think much. there was much more to their life than that. But she, she, this is Amy, she felt something was off, but she was afraid to confront it. She just had this nagging feeling that something was wrong in their relationship with her and her husband, but she really didn't want to get into it because that would take a lot of time and energy, but really it was out of fear. She really just didn't want to see what might be there. It's kind of like that closet that you don't want to open up because you're afraid to see what's in there. So she would ignore these problems or this, I guess you'd say this prompting, this, you know, this tap on that shoulder, that feeling that there's something wrong in the relationship and needs to 
needs to address it. Until one night, middle of the night, she wakes up in the middle of the night and notices her husband's not in bed with her. And she's like, oh, I wonder where, what he's doing. So she gets out of bed and tiptoes down into his office and he's up in his office uh, still working. And that's when she decided, you know, I'm going to finally confront this. I'm not going to just let it slide. And she and her husband had finally confronted whatever it was that was bothering her in their marriage. The thing is, uh, what I love about this story is a lot of times we like to do what I call first order of change. When we have problems in our marriage, we like to make a lot of modifications without really changing the system. These are like low effort, low courage things. It's like, let's focus on love languages. Let's go on more dates um, as if those alone are going to solve the marriage issues. Or what we need to do is spend equal time with in-laws or we need to work out a schedule, how we're going to use our time better. So we're more tit for tat, more whatever. I'm not saying those are pro or um, those solutions are not helpful, but if they don't change the system, if they don't change the marriage dynamic, if they don't pressure the couple to really grow up, then all you're doing is rearranging, you're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as it's about to sink. It, it is no good. What we really need to do is challenge people to take courageous action that changes the operating system of the relationship. It requires them high courage, high effort to bring their best selves and change the dynamic, the, the, the dance that's going on in that marriage. So part of that requires each person to self-confront. And I love this term. It's a willingness to take on yourself. The most hardest person a person ever has to deal with is themselves. Because in your own brain, no one's more critical than yourself. No one's more unwilling to change than, than to tackle yourself, right? Um, and that's why we want our spouse to do all the changing so I don't have to change, <laughs> right? It's a lazy approach. What we want to do is really self-confront, take yourself on, and it's that willingness. One question uh, uh, to ask is like, what would it be like being married to me? And to stop playing chicken. Sometimes we're just so afraid to act. We're so afraid to rock the boat. Um, although there's something better on the other side, we're just so afraid of the risks involved. By the way, if you do self-confront, it's super sexy. It's a great thing to do. So if you want to know the rest of the story of Amy and Greg, when she got up in the middle of the night, went down to his office, and what she saw him doing... You'll want to listen to this episode. It's episode 101, and it's a fantastic example of a couple that was in this parallel marriage, low exposure, very superficial, and then they addressed their challenges head on, took an enormous amount of courage, and they broke out of that, you know, first order change into a second order change. They really changed their marriage into something that's fantastic and thriving and growing now. Okay, we talked about A, B, and C which are really important frameworks and uh, I think foundations to helping couples with their sex life. Now, we're about half hour in. Let me share with you two sex tips that took me 13 years to, <laughs> in my marriage to learn that I wish I had known on, my, uh, on day one. The first tip that I've learned is that the clitoris is the, sen is the sexual center of a woman, not the vagina. You probably already know that though. <laughs> Number two, is there's something called responsive desire versus spontaneous desire, and, it, and it's a desire pattern. And I wish I had known that a lot longer. Um, spontaneous desire is when you can process cues in your environment about you know, sexual cues. You can process them really quickly, and desire seems to come readily. Like, hey, I feel like I'm always in the mood. This is like, I... My wife steps out of the shower, I see her, and my body immediately responds. And I get excited, like, hey, I have a good idea. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> right? I, 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 I tend to ex exhibit more spontaneous desire in that kind of circumstance. Uh, responsive desire, on the other hand, is you don't think about sex really until something sexy is going on, and then desire will show up afterwards. Uh, for I used to be so puzzled, like, why is it when my wife steps out of the shower, I get excited sexually, but when it's me stepping out of the shower and she sees me, how come she's not turned on? I'm a handsome guy. 
<laughs> What's wrong with her? Is something broken? Nothing's broken. Nothing's gone wrong. It was my thinking was wrong because I didn't know there was things like a spontaneous desire versus uh, responsive desire. There are parts of my life where I experience a lot of responsive desire. For example, there are some mornings I do not feel like doing a workout or going on a run or anything. Yet, I don't feel like it at first, but I know that once I get started, I might like it. I'll put on my running shoes, I'll put on my workout clothes, and I'll go start the exercise. And a little while in, I start it starts feeling good. I'm like, yeah, I like this. And by the time I'm done, I'm like, I'm so glad I showed up for myself. I'm so glad I did it. That's responsive desire. Something sexy, something arousing has to go on first before you feel desire. Another concept about developing desire in relationships is this idea of breaks versus accelerators. There are things for everyone has breaks and accelerators. Some people have a more sensitive break. Some people have a more sensitive accelerator. But think about breaks. What are things that turn you off sexually? And understanding, do you know what turns you off sexually? That's an important thing to know. Also, do you know what things turn you on sexually? What things would you like? What things do you like in bed? What things do you like? What context do you find really appealing to you uh, sexually? Do you know those things? It's interesting how many couples really don't know, or how many individuals really don't know what their accelerators are or what their brakes are. When you and your spouse can really work together and understand breaks and accelerators and can work together as an intimate team to collaborate, it does a lot of things. Now, uh, for most couples, the number one break is stress. When you feel stress, your desire to be sexually intimate is immediately gone. And that's, that's okay. That's common. So what can you do in life to help reduce some stress? Are there lifestyle changes to make? Are there, uh, can you share the mental load, the often invisible, non-ending to-do list that a lot of people carry? Can you share that with your spouse and kind of work together as a team better to reduce the overall stress? And cup, wise couples know, just like driving a car, if you have one foot on the brake, you can still like get somewhere maybe by stepping on that accelerator, but it comes at a cost, right? It's so much better to take pressure off the brake first before applying the accelerator. Couples will get twice as further in their sexual relationships once they understand that they'll get further taking pressure off the brakes, whatever that, whatever the brakes are in their relationship and identifying those and then like taking the pressure off the brakes. The other thing too is, to remember is in every marriage, there is a spouse that has higher desire for sex compared to the other. And it's always relative. Um, just like I married a woman that's a little shorter than me, but I could have married a woman taller than me. Like sexual desire is relative. Um, so uh, working with those differences in desire is the work of helping couples achieve a great sex life. Wise couples also, they just learn to work together as a team. And I like this idea of a staircase because most often it's how we approach sex I'm talking to the higher desire spouse now, like how they approach sex really matters. For example, most of the time, a higher desire spouse might be on, let's say there's 10 stairs on the staircase and, and stair 10 is like, I'm ready for sex right now. They might be on stair eight or nine at the time they approach their spouse. Hey, do you want to have sex tonight? And their spouse might be on step one or two. And it's easy for the higher desire spouse to get frustrated that their spouse is on step one or two and they kind of expect their spouse to take a giant leap from step two and drag them up the stairs to step eight or nine to where they are. It's just not practical. What a wise, hard as our spouse can do is, you know, go down to the level of that spouse, level one or two, and work together on anything that's pleasurable, anything that's connecting. And what can we do to get from stair number two to stair three? And enjoy that process. And once you're on stair three, if you feel like going to stair four, can we work to stair four? Can we work to stair five? Can we work to stair six? It is taking things one step at a time and recognizing there is a difference. There's a gap to cross and working together as a team to do that. Now, for the lower desire spouse, a wise lower desire spouse might think, you know what? I'm not in the mood. I'm in the middle of folding laundry. I'm in the middle of, I don't know, uh, 
I've got a work project tomorrow and I'm thinking about what needs to happen. I'm thinking about this presentation I need to give, whatever it might be. But I will work at getting myself there and you can help me get there. Um, you see, they, they trust themselves. I'm going to, I will, because I care about this relationship, I'm going to trust to work on bringing my desire up to where I want to be. I will make the efforts because I know what works for me. That's kind of how you work together as a couple there. A good example of a couple that I think that really worked on de developing desire is Jeff and Leanne. So they've been married like 30 or 40 years. Uh, in their marriage, Jeff is the one with a higher desire for sex than Leanne. Um, and it had been a source of conflict in their marriage for a while until Leanne really turned, really looked, figured out what turns her on and what turns her off. And they're able to communicate these things and really work on these things. And for Austin, for his part, he learned how to take pressure off the brakes. And uh, what resulted is a much better, fuller, and more fulfilling sexual relationship for them. And I interviewed them on my podcast, and they tell their whole story about this, about a romantic getaway in the, in the woods at a cabin. And it's a fantastic listen. If you want to listen to that, it's episode 107 of the Get Your Marriage On podcast. Okay. We are ready to talk about E, <laughs> embracing eroticism. This is my favorite topic. Once I realized that having a lot of sexual desire for me was a blessing, not a curse, my whole world opened up to me. My inner creativity was unleashed in the bedroom and sex became a place of fun, play, and replenishment. It was like the ultimate playground for adults. Like <laughs> this is a great place to be. Now, we all have an erotic side to us. Um, erotic, like we're a spiritual person, a physical person. We're also an erotic person. There's things, we have proclivities, we should say. Things that we're drawn to, themes that we find sexually exciting. And learning to grow and develop those helps you kind of grow and develop as a person. There's something beautiful about wanting to grow your sexual being forces you to grow in so many other areas at the same time. So like embracing that this is a good part of me is a great step forward. This is uh, my take on things that, and I get this idea from uh, Dr. Esther Perel, who's done some research on this, on eroticism. And she says, sex isn't really a thing you do. It's a place you go. And I love that picture because sex is really more like where in your mind do you go with this thing? Sex is a place you go in your mind rather than something you do. So can you make sex a place of a vacation? Something exciting, something wonderful? I overheard two women talking. One was pregnant, about to have a baby. And she's saying, I look forward to after the baby comes of this six-week moratorium on sex. My husband, he has no, like, I'm so looking forward to getting a break from my husband pestering me about sex for these six weeks. The other woman was like, she's kind of, you know, crestfallen, like, Oh, that's sad. I I actually hate the six week moratorium because I love sex. I look forward to it, and it, I just can't wait for these six weeks to be done when I have a baby, so that we can get busy again. Because for her, in sex, she looked at it as this is a time I get pampered. This is a time it feels really good to me. This is a time it feels like I get a break from the mundane things of everyday living, and I get to go to something a little extraordinary. What is sex for you? What kind of meanings do you attach to it? Speaking of meanings and attaching to sex, a lot of times when you ask them, so what do you think about sex? What excites you? They have a difficult time answering that question because they've never really explored it. They've never really taken the time to embrace their eroticism. One thing I recommend couples do or individuals do is take out a pen and a paper. And I get this idea from Nicole Daydon. She wrote a book on, um, on this concept. And what you do is you set the timer, let's say for 10 minutes, you get settled first and you try not to lift your pen for 10 minutes. You just write, 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 write. And what you're gonna do is give your sexual side of you, your erotic side of you, a voice. And you're just answering the question, what does my sexuality want? And after the 10 minutes is done, you can look at your paper and sometimes you'll be surprised what came out. Like, wow, I didn't expect that to come out. 
And you might be embarrassed. You might throw away the paper or burn it, or you might be excited and want to go share, share it with your spouse, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, giving yourself some time and space without judgment, without evaluating, you know, just can you suspend judgment for a minute? Just give your sexual self a voice. It's amazing what, what you can find in that. Now, I, there's also what I call um, novelty. Novelty is a, a critical aspect if you want to have a vibrant sex life over the long while. But we, we can get novelty in two different ways. I call it horizontal and I call it vertical novelty. Horizontal novelty might be like, you know, trying new sex positions or new locations or being really naughty, uh, toys, uh, role playing, and so on and so on. There's a lot of... There's a lot of products out there and there's a lot of websites and it's endless how much novelty you can find out there they can incorporate into your sexual relationship. And in and of itself, I think these things uh, are fine. And when you can use them to kind of create deeper meaning in your relationship, some fun, some excitement, uh, they can build that sexual relationship. But um, horizontal things are not the only thing that add novelty to your relationship. There's vertical things. By vertical, I mean, can you look at this person that you wake up next to morning after morning after morning, the sameness of this person, yet today, look at them in with fresh eyes and in a new light? These might going on a new experience with your spouse or seeing your spouse in a new way. For example, my wife, Emily, uh, is, is shy, but one Christmas, she organized an amazing choir uh, at our house. Uh, to practice for to sing at sing at an event and for a shy person who's usually timid to to you know get on the phone which is hard for her call all these people and pick out a music selection and uh, practice with this group was so fun for me to see her step outside her comfort zone and kind of like be the boss <laughs> for a moment with these ladies with this thing that she wanted to do the singing choir and it sounded amazing too. And uh, now when I make love with her, I'm making love with a new Emily. It's not the old Emily from before. She's taken on this new persona that I haven't seen before. It's really sexy. That's what I mean by vertical novelty. When you can experience your spouse in new ways, making love with them is going to be different. And adds newness and freshness to the whole, to the whole experience. Uh, a good example of this is um, a woman named Ashley. She struggled for many years in her marriage to have an orgasm. She tried everything. She bought the vibrators. She bought the courses. She read the books. Nothing was working for her. She was so frustrated. Anyway, uh, we got in touch and we had a, a coaching session. And uh, through that, you can learn more about it. If you want to listen to my podcast, episode 121, I interview her about her experience after the fact. Uh, she, what it was is she just really embraced the erotic nature of herself. And then once she did, everything changed quickly. She had her first orgasm, which was amazing for her. And then it gave her confidence. Like, okay, now I know what it feels like. I know what to do. And ever since then, things have been great for her in her marriage. I'm not saying orgasm is necessary to have a great marriage, but for her, the goal of having a more, you know, more pleasure in sex was really important to her. And she was able to do it when she really embraced her eroticism. In it. And you can get more of that from episode 121. Okay, let's recap real quick. This is what we've covered. There are A, B, C, D, E's. Awareness, balanced belonging, courageous action, developing desire, and embracing your eroticism. Um, and these are the things that I've learned from the couples that have a fun and engaging sex life and kind of what they do and what I've experienced too. All right. I would love to take your questions now and I'm excited to be here with you uh, for as much time as you need. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Dan. I loved that presentation. We'll go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, the first one we have is from someone saying, I am the lower desire spouse. And I'm wondering what strategies you think I can tell my husband to start finding a better sexual median. I want to work on my part, but I also want him to understand this. What do you suggest? All right. The question again, I want a, a better sexual, you said medium? Yeah. They said median. A median. 
Uh, like middle. Yeah. Gotcha. Good, good. There's, there's that negotiation. Like I want um, like frequency or whatever. Um, but it's really not about frequency as much as it is about um, bringing your best self to the relationship. Uh, there's actually no problem being lower desire. There's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with being higher desire. But when you use your low desire as an excuse to hide in your relationship, it, like because I'm low desire, I don't need to put an effort into the sexual relationship. When you use that to kind of, kind of hide behind, or people with higher desire too, because it, that's just as much as a hiding position. Because I have higher desire, I'm entitled to more from you. Like that attitude is also antithetical to creating an uh, intimate relationship. So it's not so much about like, okay, you want sex five times a week. I want it one time a week. Can we meet in the middle and be both happy with three? I mean, that might be the outcome of it, but it's less about like a tit for tat transaction it's really more about what can i do to bring my best self to this intimate relationship that i can be happy about and challenging your spouse who might have higher desire what can he do to bring his best self to the relationship too so that there's something that you're both happy about the last thing i want to say is anxiety sometimes drives low desire and high desire for example if you're a high desire spouse and you're anxious about when's the next time I'm going to have sex? I don't know. Like, it's going to drive your behavior to want sex more <laughs> because you're anxious about, it's like the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. <laughs> you don't, right? You run out of stock of toilet paper. That's all you think about. I got to get more of this because I don't know when I'm going to get it again. Uh, that anxiety is going to drive a spouse to be higher desire. And then anxiety about sex drives a person to be low desire. Like, I, I don't like, this part of sex i don't like my i haven't embraced my own sexuality yet i haven't really stepped into this i'm anxious about sex so that drives low desire too so um when you're using each other to manage your anxieties that's not going to help you build a great sexual relationship the better solution i think is to really like what goodness can we create here and step into to create a great sexual relationship we'll both be happy to that we're both bringing our best to I hope that answered your question. Perfect. Thank you. The next person says that they don't talk with their partner about sex very often, that they are a newly engaged couple. Mm -hmm. How do they start having these conversations in a way that's not awkward? Oh, I love that question. And congratulations for being uh, new at this. Um, I get this question often. And I, if I had like the magic pill or great answer, I think I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> I think the answer is there is no way for you to no longer get over the awkwardness of the sexual conversation. I don't think it's possible. But what is possible is to increase your tolerance of the awkwardness of talking about sex. Does that make sense? The awkwardness won't go away, but your ability to tolerate the awkward feelings increase. So this is when you go, you know, we both avoid the talk, topic of sex. We don't talk about it a lot because we're anxious about it or whatever the reason is. But even though I feel uncomfortable about it, we're going to talk about it anyway. And you step into it anyway, trusting that, trusting the process, right? Like we need to talk about these things or else our sex life will never improve. So even though I'm anxious and scared about it, we're going to do it anyway. Perfect. Our next question says, my spouse and I are on the same page with our sex life, which is great. Unfortunately, one of us is dealing with a significant medical illness. We both want to continue having quality sexual intimacy experiences together. Do you have any suggestions? Great question. Um, first of all, I'm sorry about the um, significant um, medical issues. That's got to be really tough. Um, and I, I hope... I hope um, I hope things resolve there. Uh, one thing to probably to ask is, is this a uh, short term or is this long term? Is this something we'll be dealing, or do you know? If it's short term, then of course you can make some accommodations that you can work on together. If it's long term, then you can just get really creative at how you can ba basically, can you 
Can you still be intimate in some ways? Um, oftentimes, if you have significant medical illness, you have no sexual desire for good reason, right? Your body is not interested in, in, uh, in channeling your energies to those kinds of things when you're fighting an illness. So uh, these situations is really going to require a lot of understanding, a lot of open conversation. Now, when uh, I'll give you a few practical tips and um, I'm, I'm a little shy to just give practical tips, be, be, not knowing the whole context and, and value systems and everything like that. But I think if you live, before I tell you the practical tip, I think the principle to follow is a good sexual relationship has connection and pleasure. Those two things. What is connecting to us? What is pleasurable for us? Can you live that principle? And if you make that your guiding principle, then I think it'll help you both kind of relate better. A lot of times we take the definition of, here's the practical part. A lot of times we take, did we have sex? Um, meaning for most people in our Western culture, that means, did we have sexual intercourse? Like, was there orgasm and ejaculation in the right spot <laughs> with the way we interacted, right? But did the penis go in the vagina? That's that's like our check mark if, if we had sex or not. But wise couples learn how to expand their definition of sex to include more than just like a penis and a vagina, for example. It's it's more than that. Is there a way we can hug, kiss, make out, uh, touch, enjoy pleasure together that we both find connecting and exciting? Uh, those all things count. Like things that you do, like considering foreplay would be good. So some practical tips might be like, can I hold you while I touch myself? Can we uh, maybe cuddle naked? Can we, um, uh, can we try this? Um, can we try a sex position where um, I can take care of a lot of my own stimulation while I'm with you skin to skin? And there's, you can, get really creative there and I'll let your imagination take over. But I, the, if you follow those two principles, connection and pleasure, and really work together around it and just with a lot of compassion and understanding for each other, I think it'll help you as a couple grow closer together. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Um, this next question says that they have a couple people they know um, that they do therapy sessions with who they think would benefit from coaching, but they're not exactly sure what the difference between um, your coaching sessions and what coaching with marital things with and the therapy. looks like besides therapy. Great, fantastic question. Uh, the lines are blurry. There's really very little difference. The things I would coach a couple on would be very, very, very similar to another couple uh, sorry, another therapist coaching them. The, the main difference though, um, uh, when you say a, a coach, uh, sorry, a, when you say a licensed therapist, they're also, they're licensed like in the state of Utah, they're licensed to treat mental illness, they're licensed to diagnose. And uh, with the laws and the way they are, you don't, you can't do that across state lines. So a lot of therapists are turning to coaching to avoid um, the license uh, issues with being a therapist. Then again, they're not going to diagnose mental illness. They're not going to um, do any of that across state lines anyway, because for, for ethical reasons. So coaching in the end is the same concepts that you'd learn with a therapist. Um, it just doesn't require the licensing needed uh, because you're not treating mental illness or those sorts of things too. Perfect. We just have one more question as we close out our webinar. Um, they said they live a pretty high anxiety life. A lot of the things they do are driven by anxiety. And so they're wondering what is a helpful example you have for people to start practicing courageous action? Mm, I would love a scenario, a specific scenario that I can help them with. Um, all right. You can email me if you want to, and I'll answer that. So let me give you um, just some thoughts off the top of my head based on the little information I have. 
uh, it's high anxiety for both of you. I'm assuming high anxiety about sex. We both want a better sex life, but we don't. It, every time I bring it up, my spouse gets triggered or something. They withdraw uh, and that triggers me. And so there's like this, like we go around and around and around and we're both very reactive to each other. That's what I'm assuming is happening in the question. Uh, the way around that is to develop the skill. Oh, so, so to take courageous action, yes. To take courageous action in that would be, can you have a conversation without getting reactive yourself? It's, it's a mindfulness practice more than anything. Can you learn how to like calm yourself down? Can you learn how to separate what you have control over and you don't have control over? By definition, we're anxious about things that are unknown. Like, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. We're anxious about things we don't know, we don't understand. Can you uh, settle in that? Like, no, this is what I do know. I don't know this, and I'm okay not knowing this. I'm okay knowing this. And that settling in that. Um, deep breathing helps, uh, incorporating movement. So if you can talk about these things while you're on a walk, those are some practical things you can do because when your body is moving, it kind of helps your brain stay more emotionally regulated. Um, time of day, don't bring up these topics when you're both exhausted at, you know, midnight, <laughs> like have a good time to have these conversations and just recognize it, this is like a muscle. It's going to take some time to develop. But don't shy away from that work. Like these are things I want to do to really elevate and take our marriage intimacy wherever it is to its next level. I hope that's helpful. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for being on with us today. And thank you everyone else for joining us. It was a pleasure to be here with you. And we're so grateful for your questions and your participation here tonight. Once again, if you attended this webinar for a CEU credit, Make sure to stay on until the webinar ends for your survey and certification or email into the UMC email, which is marriagecommission at usu.edu for your survey. Upon completion of the survey, you'll get a certification email back from us. Thanks so much, Dan, and thanks everyone. Have a great night. Bye.